Hi, uh, I'm Saurav. I'm one of the engineering leads in the Maps team in Facebook. And today we are here to talk to you about how we use OSM at Facebook. And uh, my colleagues, uh, Yunzi and Dr. Kevin Ventulo, will be covering that. We also have Saikat and Derek from the team here. So after the talk, find us. We'd love to chat more about this. Yunzi? Thank you, Saurav. Um, okay, so how does how does Facebook involve? So how Facebook involve OpenStreetMap? The answer is very simple. So Facebook uses OSMs in all our products and family apps. And last year we mentioned about rollout, um, and these were the 22 countries that we had using OSM on Facebook apps last year. And this year, we are pretty much showing OSM across in all over the world in all our applications that goes into 2 billion people. So in order to do for us to be able to do the rollout, we actually focus our efforts in two areas. The first one is to remove bad stuff so the map can be free of profanities and vandalism. And the second one is, is adding good stuff. Um, which you might already been familiar with from the last talk. So remove bad stuff is a really important part of our work. It includes a lot of work. Profanity check is one of our most important validation process. We start with doing our own research by creating a list of potential profanity from everything online and open, talking to different integrity team at Facebook and crowdsourcing from all the people we know, adding, having them adding all the bad words they know in a shared doc. We then run uh, the list against the word PBF file and find that there are 84,000 matches specifically for the name tag. So even with this, with uh, in-house editing teams, it's still very really hard for us to handle all 84,000 words. So we did some filtering uh, based on different rules. Then we came up with a more manageable list. And eventually, we are so happy to figure out that only 139 of them are actual issues contextually. And we went in and fixed them on live OSM. Here's how diverse our teams is to support us to extend the profanity words list. And one technique we apply on a profanity track is called optical character recognition. Applying confidence level on text in image to help looking for profanity words. Of course, we also use OSM track, Osmos, keep writes for Windows track. So for adding good stuff, um, so which is our AI assist road tracing that we use in Thailand. Now we apply this technique in Indonesia. We tweak the model a little bit and add more training data. And this is how the training data look like. They are also complete in-house with our editing team. Um, when we have enough training data, we run a machine learning model for detections. This is a sample raw output of Indonesia roads. And then we run some post-processing using the high threshold on center line of roads, connecting gaps, removing island roads, and vectorizing the detections into XML formats. Lastly, we create projects in Task Manager with those predicted data. We use ID Editor to do manual editing. And here's the example videos of how we proceed. In the past couple months, uh, a new feature we add is the side panel here um, for being easier to go over all validation track. And these are all the validation track we add to the ID editor.
so these ID editors, uh, we have been released these ID editors. So they are open source, and you can find it on OSM Labs called Validation ID. Um, we use the same models on uh, on areas other than Indonesia and Thailand. Here, here's one, some of them, like Mexico and Uganda. So to have for having a better role editing in Indonesia, we coordinate with a local community, Heart Indonesia, this year. With effort from both Facebook and Heart, we have complete um, some we have complete some country scale role cleanups, in person trainings, AI assisting projects in Indonesia, and ground truth research. crowdsourcing on street names in Indonesia from over 2 billion users all over the world. So what's next? Um, well, because the map is continuously changed, so we definitely have a ton to map. But where to map? Um, so we apply, therefore apply the population density to help us uh, find out where to map. So one data set Facebook has released is population density data sets. Here are how they look like. Um, these are also open data set that you can find on season. Here's a health project in Malawi, an example of how we do the, oh sorry, how, example of how population density supports to narrow down the area um, with houses, so it's, um, we it's more a more applicable maps can be done faster. And using Uganda as another example, this will show how it looks like when we use population density to target area easier in an efficient way. So this is 80% um, of dense area are being mapped if we apply population density. And then this is 90%. 95% and then 99.5%. Okay, so I'm gonna hand it to Kevin who will talk about more on our project Mobius. Hi, um, so I'm here to talk about how uh, Facebook will ingest OSM data going forward. So to give some context, um, all the work that uh, was just previously mentioned about keeping out the bad edits uh, was done on a static snapshot of OSM. So in other words, we took a snapshot of OSM from over a year ago now uh, and just you know tried to find all of the bad stuff in it and filter that out and, and make hot patches. Um, but in the meantime, lots of data has been added to OSM. And, uh, what makes catching up so tricky is that data is kind of constantly being added. Every few seconds, someone's adding a road, you know, deleting a relation, some vandalism is added and then reverted, uh, et cetera. So one way to frame this is as a, a problem of striking a balance between freshness and correctness. So up until this point, uh, we focused almost exclusively on correctness. We just wanted to make sure that the data that was in there was correct. Um, but now we've decided we want to start thinking about freshness because in the year or so since that snapshot was taken, a lot of data has been added to OSM, including by us. Um, so, uh, you know, although there were a few hot patches that we did, by and large we stayed on our fixed snapshot. So what makes this so difficult? Um, the sheer volume of edits means that the longer we wait, the the larger the gap is between what we have and what's actually in the latest branch of OSM. So the farther and farther we drift apart. Um, and there's, there's kind of two issues that we're concerned with. There's two reasons we, we can't just automatically just ingest the latest uh, OSM PBF. Uh, one is actual vandalism, where someone goes in and you know adds profanity to the name of a street or just labels some city you know in, in some inappropriate way. Um, but actually what we see even more volume of is uh, just kind of bad edits from possibly well-meaning but you know newer mappers. So for example, if someone's trying to fix a road 
and they accidentally touch you know, a node of a polygon for a lake, say, and they make the polygon cross itself, then that can actually make the lake not render correctly. It may make the polygon invalid, which will make the lake render as land, for example. And so we want to catch that. And, you know, malicious or not, um, just not ingest that until it gets fixed upstream. <coughs> so when we were starting out, our core assumption was basically, you know, we have to catch up all at once. We, you know, sort of take the same tack as before. We, you know, take this new snapshot from November 2018. Uh, we have our map from a year ago. And you just take the static diff, and you find all of the problems, and you know, just then once you've found every single problem, apply the entire change set. Uh, and you know, other than the problem areas, we're just going to catch up all at once. The problem is, is that finding all the problems, as previously discussed, takes a very long time, and you never quite know if you've caught everything. So then we started thinking, okay, well, you know, what if we could catch up to OSM Master without actually updating the entire world all at once? You know, in principle, it seems kind of weird. If, if you want to add some roads in Brazil, uh, you know, why should that be predicated on adding a park in Japan or fixing the name of a street in Madagascar? So, you know, we started asking ourselves, is there some way to apply changes independently in some way, but while maintaining geometric and uh, referential consistency? So when I say referential consistency, what I mean is, you know, if, if you just took a way that was added recently and tried to, you know, put it into your OSM data, then it may reference a bunch of nodes that don't actually exist in that data, and now you won't render the way correctly. Um, so that's just one possible thing that can go wrong. Um, and by geometric consistency, I mean, you know, you don't want roads that just sort of end in the middle of nowhere or that have gaps in them, which may, you know, consist of multiple features. So the answer is, can we catch up? You know, partially, uh, the answer is yes. And the way that you do that is via what we've dubbed uh, logical change sets or lochas. And uh, Sorov has indicated to me that locha has another meaning in Hindi. <laughs> 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 so what is a logical change set? So you start with what we had before. You have two snapshots of OSM. You have some old one from a year ago, and you have a very recent one. And you take that static diff. And by itself, the static diff, you know, using existing open source tools, is essentially just a list of things that changed. It says this node changed to this, this way was modified to this, this relation was deleted, et cetera. Um, but it's hard to do much with that on its own. Um, and so what the Locha algorithm does is it takes this giant kind of atomic diff and breaks it up into smaller, more manageable, and geometrically localized changes uh, with the following properties. So idempotent means that I can take a single locha, which is like a small change set, and I can apply it twice, and it, it will do the same thing as applying it once. Um, they're commutative, which means that I can apply the lochas, sort of, you know, commutative and independent are kind of one and the same, and that I can apply the lochas independently, meaning that I can, you know, if I have 10 of them and I decide to accept some eight of them, I can kind of apply those eight in any order, and I still end up with the same map. Um, and they're they're independent and they're kind of geometrically separated. So it means that I can kind of focus on a single geographical area. Um, you can sort of think of this in version control terms as sort of taking one giant diff, breaking it up into a bunch of smaller diffs, and then every rebase possible is clean. Um, and it guarantees geometric consistency independent of whether you accept or reject the change. Uh, so, and th this kind of fixes that problem I was talking about before, where you might have a road that has a dead end. So if you're going to accept part of a road, you really want to accept the entire road. So breaking this down computationally, uh, what you start out with is a bunch of OSM change sets. So an OSM change set is when a mapper goes in and they change a bunch of things, you know, all this feature changed to this, this node changed to this, that's considered like a single OSM change set, a single session. Um, and you can break all of those down into their constituent CRUD ops, right? Just literally just a list of individual changes to features. Uh, and then you take all those individual CRUD ops and then you re-aggregate them into these logical change sets. And so it's worth pointing out that the logical change set you end up with may have feature changes from multiple OSM change sets over multiple time periods. So uh, if someone changed a road eight months ago, and then two months ago, someone tweaked the road just a little bit more, we'll probably aggregate those two changes into a single logical change set. Um, and conversely, uh, if a single OSM session uh, for a single person uh, involved changing 
geometry is kind of all spread out throughout the world. So you know, maybe they made some change in Russia and then they made some change in Brazil. Uh, we're going to probably label those as separate logical change sets, or they, they'll be part of separate logical change sets. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. And so this is what the review looks like. So the whole point of uh, breaking these up into logical change sets is to b put them in front of people and then have them decide, is this a good change or not? Should, should this be accepted or is this possibly vandalism? Um, and it's optimized for you know, the human in the loop. So it's, it's a binary decision. You just look at this single change and you say, is this good or not? Yes or no? You know, if so, great. If not, you know, we have some things we can give reasons about why it not, might not be good. Um, but there's, there's no editing of, of logical change sets. So if, if there is a problem with the diff that you saw, then maybe you file a task or something and fix it downstream. So it's all about fixing it uh, upstream, rather, in, in OSM. We're, we're not making local changes. Um, and so then finally, once we've you know, accepted a bunch of lochas, uh, we can apply them. And we just take that logical change set, we break it up into its constituent geometric CRUD operations, and, uh, and apply it. And uh, by the construction of, of the locha, we know that the end result will remain uh, geometrically consistent. Uh, if every logical change set were approved, then that's the same thing as just moving to the new snapshot of the data. <coughs> so the takeaway is you don't have to accept everything all at once. You can sort of break up this giant massive atomic uh, change set and into these more manageable, geometrically localized and uh, consistent chunks. So the first prototype of this that we built uh, a few months ago, uh, we took the diff between you know, the OSM version as of July 27th, 2018, and diffed it with our local version, which is from July 17th, 2017. Uh, and we just kind of looked at the area around Boston Cambridge instead of doing the entire world. And uh, you can see sort of we got some compression amount among the total number of change sets. And um, you can see that like many of the logical change sets only involved a single feature, but uh, many of the features were in, in a few logical change sets. Um, so we're currently working on kind of improving the actual algorithm for breaking these things down. Um, we're working on integrating the previously mentioned work on profanity and OCR detection to flag potentially problematic change sets uh, for the purpose of reviewers to kind of give them a hint that, you know, oh, like we actually kind of think maybe there is a problem with this change set. You should take a closer look at this. Um, Basically, we want to codify heuristics and signals about the complexity of the changes and pipe that back into the UI and just give the reviewer as much signal as possible. Uh, so what's next? Uh, so we have run a prototype now on the whole world, uh, and now we're just thinking about how do we refine the clustering. So there are still some problems with the aggregation where you, you know, maybe you get like some tiny changes or you you uh, accidentally, you know, you maybe you connect too many things. So there there could be change sets that are actually quite large because there's a you know an entire added road network. So we're working on how do we break these down into things that s so that you know no matter what the the locha that you get is always a manageable uh, reviewable size. It's something that someone can look at and say yes that's good or no it's not. Um, separating structural and cosmetic changes. So you know adding roads versus changing the labels of a road, uh, and like I said integrating the OCR and profanity checks. Um, you know, and finally, I want to end by saying, uh, you know, th these are the things that we're currently thinking about, but we've sort of designed all of this stuff keeping what's important to us in mind. So, for example, we don't really think much about navigation. We mo mainly think about displaying maps. Uh, but we'd love to get feedback from the broader community about, like, you know, what are the characteristics of OSM data that are important to you? Like, how would you want to break things up, or what would you want to highlight when looking at these changes? Um, so if something comes to mind, you know, definitely come find me or Yunji or uh, any of my colleagues here and, uh, you know, let us know what's interesting to you. Uh, and then uh, finally I want to end on a video showing some of our mapping efforts in Thailand.
thank you so much. Uh, any questions? Um, I don't. I, I don't know his name. Uh, I'm Saurabh. This is Gilri. This is Kevin. Kevin, hi. So um, about the logical changes, if you even keep five percent as suspect, right? And and if it's not shown to the people because of that, local people who would be helping you correct it, then it will only delay the updating of the uh, map. Whereas it's back to the OSM people to find and fix it. Am I right? Uh, this is intended for an ingestion process for somebody who has an internal copy of OSM. Like, we have changes that are coming in from the community, and at Facebook we use like a base map to show our maps. So, like the things that are flagged as suspect, they are obviously bad. So what we are doing is we are pinning the version of a feature till it gets fixed in OSM, and you're right that it has to be fixed in OSM, but it is not necessarily we are depending on someone else to fix it. We have our own mappers who are uh, we can open a ticket against them. Uh, the biggest motivation behind framing it this way was that we really want to make OSM maps better. But at the same time, it's a belts and suspenders kind of approach where we want to make sure that when we consume the data, the data we take is clean. Like recently, there was a very high profile vandalism of New York City name changing. We, don't, we want to guard against things like that. But at the same time, we want to empower the community into fixing, into creating OSM maps as the way it has always been. It is like kind of... The we flag it. Yeah. We flag it. We open it. Like we contribute to uh, OSM Cha. We both consume and contribute back in terms of the profanity and the suspect uh, things. We are uh, open about what we found suspect. We con con immediately flag it. So it the knowledge is released back. Which it's, it's this none of this is like secret sauce, quote unquote. This is just a uh, that's why we share the algorithm and the uh, methodology so freely. It's, we believe that this gets maximum usage if it becomes sort of a way that people approach the data handling process. So all of the methodology and the knowledge base, we kind of are very open about it. Uh, we'll take one question, but Saura will be here throughout the day, yeah. and you guys can catch up and connect. Uh, just curious, I know it's not the focus of your talk, but the profanity component of it, identifying profanity. It was interesting to me, it again, news to me as well, that you found, I think, 84,000 words of profanity across 43 languages. Uh, so I just wanted to ask, like, what is, like, again, do you have more data on who's contributing the profanity and how do you actually uh, weed so it out? This is about the corpus or the ch things we found. The corpus was basically created by, first of all, asking all our teammates to cuss as much as they can <laughs> for 15 minutes. So that got bulk of the data. And then we, at Facebook, we have a very mature content oversight uh, effort. So they also help. We share stuff. And we have been trying to set up like a group uh, industry-wide where companies can contribute to this. Because this is a very tricky thing. Like a lot of it is very English focused or at most like European language focused. So if you want to build a truly international representative uh, sort of profanity filter and detection, it has to be sourced uh, like uh, together. No one person can build it. So there are efforts along that. And feel free to uh, like come talk to us. We'll talk about it. But the original word list was, yeah, it was just 35 people cussing for 15 minutes. <laughs>